Hi, welcome back to another episode of Real World Serverless, a podcast where I speak with real world practitioners and get their stories from the trenches. Today, I'm joined by Bob Hennant, who is a principal architect at The Zone. Hey, Bob, good to have you here. Nice to be here, yeah. So I used to work at The Zone uh, around the same time as uh, you, but you've been there for a lot longer than me. And uh, you, know, you, were looking, you were working on the video streaming side of things, uh, which uh, for me was always a bit of a black box because we kind of just know, you know, building these APIs, we're surfacing these uh, you know, video streams, uh, but uh, we don't really know how pictures got from the pitch uh, all the way to, say, CloudFront distributions or other CDNs uh, and that sort of thing. So it's also pretty crazy when it comes to, you know, when, when you think about the kind of scale that the zone is running at with millions of uh, concurrent viewers. So there must be some pretty amazing challenges that you have to, uh, you have to deal with there. Um, so before we get into that, do you want to just uh, quickly introduce yourself and uh, the zone and, you know, what do you do there? Yeah, so I'm principal architect now at DAZN. Um When you knew me, I was a video architect, and now I have a wider remit, although I tend to focus on infrastructure technologies, um, uh, both cloud compute and physical infrastructure, but uh, still doing a lot on uh, content security, um, so uh, DRM and anti-piracy measures, um, I even have to do legal, patent, and regulatory oversight, uh, which is interesting, um, and an area that not a lot of engineers. I, I tend to seem to do these things that other engineers don't do. Uh, you know, who does who does content security? Who does patents? Who does government regulatory? Uh, and how many how many programmers these days want to get into actual low level infrastructure? Uh, it's not not that many, um, but. Uh, yeah, I have over 20 years in the media tech industry. Um, uh, been a technologist. Um, I did did a decade in consumer electronics as well um, for big name brands there, and um, uh, also been ex BBC, Norwegian Telecom, um, and uh, Talk Talk TV, various other different places. But yeah, now I've been at Design since 2017. Um, I've been there from when it was really small just two uh, just a, ha a couple of countries we were in before um and then uh seen it all the way to now where we're worldwide dealing with millions of subscribers and in uh doing thousands of events per week yeah i remember even when i joined uh, i think it was uh, 2018 you were still quite a small no operation. Uh, there, there's not not that not that many uh, engineers, uh, at least uh, not in the building uh, in London. Um, when we you know we had to hire, I think it was hundreds of engineers in the space of like two years. Uh, uh, and but for all that, the people that were still just working on the API side of things. Uh, and uh, you know, I've always heard a bit of a you know murmur about uh, the stuff that's happening in the video stream side of things, some of the challenges that comes with that. And when you've got uh, right now was millions of concurrent viewers. That must be some pretty interesting uh, scalability challenges. Uh, um, can you maybe talk briefly, at least in a high, on a high level, what kind of uh, scale that um, the zone is running at and what kind of problems that comes with that? Yeah, um, I won't uh, divulge any company numbers around uh, what we can. That some There are some public stuff done, but I, I, I wouldn't want to try and remember the exact numbers that we published. Um, uh, we're a privately owned organization, so we don't do that, but we don't have to do that. Um, the, but it's, it's interesting because we have, we, we have over a hundred sports rights and anything from competitive lumberjacking and competitive fishing to the hottest thing. So we've got the, the, uh, NFL national football in in the USA, but we we cover the rest of the world. So we run uh, NFL Game Pass, what was NFL Game Pass International, for the, on behalf of the NFL. We have um, uh, the uh, Italian Serie A, and Italians are fanatical about their football. Um, so uh, yeah, we have Syria. I think we also have Serie B and uh, other content. We have Japan J League, um, J League One, Two, and Three. Um, we have a significant amount of sports in in Spain. Um, uh, we uh, we also have the um, uh, I 
a decent impact in the Dach region, in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. Um, and then we have our fight sports as well. So we do both um, uh, subscription based match uh, coverage, which is very extensive across a wide range of fight sports. And then we now do pay-per-view boxing as well. Um, which um, has been uh, an interesting shift uh, for us moving from a pure subscription. And then I think recently we're also uh, currently um, launching the um, free to view as well. So people can just sign up and watch um, a selection of content. We've been a big advocate of women's sport, um, which has seen massive increases in audience since we've been able to provide more coverage rather than just a match here and a match there. We provide regular coverage of women's football uh, in particular. Uh, as when We've even got some, we, we started mostly doing event-based. So the model was everything is about the events. Um, but then we got more and more demand for having what we call linear channels, which is like what you'd be traditionally familiar with. Um, we do some of those syndicated out to uh, partners like internet service providers or cable TV companies or satellite TV companies. Um, <clears throat> and some of them we just run on our platform because some people just want to turn on and watch something. They're not, uh, um, so we do these thematic channels um, uh, where somebody can watch a, a something of a particular theme and it will just carry on through. Or you can log into the app and watch live events, or you can watch uh, catch up um, uh, of a whole range of sports, uh, whatever somebody happens to be interested in. And when you go from something like uh, competitive lumberjacking, the audience can be quite small. Um, it's passionate and it's interesting to those people, and you know it can capture an interesting audience. But when you go from that to um, something as big as a, a Super Bowl or um, a local derby in Italy uh, for, for football, that can, you know, the, the disparity and the changes you have to go through. We say, like, during the middle of the week, the consumption is relatively, you know, the baseline consumption, our baseline to peak is huge. The, the, the differences in, in what you can see, you know, going from, um, relatively modest numbers and then scaling over a thousand times to the weekend um, can be uh, can be a challenge because you're you're not how do you how do you plan for that level of compute change and also unlike say uh, a traditional video on demand uh, provider like say Netflix or Amazon. People, if, if, if you release a new episode of a program, um, say, you know, the old Game of Thrones effect or, or whatever we want to go for as being the current thing now, they can take a piece of content and they can pre-seed it out to their CDNs before they've made it available, to the, before they've made the listing available. We can't do that because we, we could do it for VOD, but VOD is not the most significant part of our traffic the real heart of our traffic is the live consumption and people will turn on to watch the game at the time that it's starting so your ramp up volumes and your scaling and you probably maybe even remember that the, the scaling challenges auto scaling doesn't always work and if you, unless you put very uh, aggressive pre-scaling in before so you have to know what your game is going to do you have to have an idea that how we have analysts running numbers to figure out how many people are going to watch a particular game and then we will uh, make sure that we go into the weekend or go into that evening or that afternoon having everyone ready for that thing and you'll remember the readiness calls where oh the uh, are, are we gonna are we gonna turn up this are we gonna uh, spend doing this process you know are we gonna make sure that we don't have any resource contention all of that kind of stuff we, you have to be really careful of and the other thing is that in live um, efficiencies can go out of the window as well so a, a traditional CDN distribution 
um, you'll get a, a much different ratio of cash efficiency through the CDN in file delivery versus live streaming delivery because when people are asking for that file it, it is better distributed through the CDN network whereas in live streaming delivery everyone is asking for the same segment at the same time because they're all watching at the same time so you can imagine the race conditions are horrible <laughs> you can imagine and you're talking about terabits per seconds of requests now we can be in 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 large numbers of terabits per second <laughs> of requests now, i don't think i can uh, say exactly but you know we're talking more than single digit terabits per seconds worth of requests in a single country how do you how do you deal with that race condition where at the edge all the requests are coming in for the same file at the same second even sub second level requests because we actually ntp sync all of the clients on playback <laughs> so they they the, the clients all know exactly what the time is so you can see that would be a that would be a horrible efficiency problem to deal with yeah i, I mean it's, it's, it's surprising how the cdns even deal with uh, things like this uh, you know you've got these really small files uh, as soon as, as soon as it hits in one location guests have to be distributed to all the locations uh, almost instantly because yeah. everyone is like you said is looking for that same segment to uh, to, to enable the the playback for the next uh, five seconds of uh, footage and that, that's um, where we use the the that's where multi cdn really comes in because we when we go into a season and in a week so we'll we'll do pre analysis for the season but we'll also do every week or every two weeks we'll be planning what's coming up and that what's coming up will inform we'll talk to the cdns themselves and we have great account managers and folk at the cdns and we'll pre warn them we'll say this is coming up, that's coming up, you know, this is going to be a big weekend, we know it's going to be a big weekend, and they will tell us, and they are on, they're instructed to tell us, can you do it? We will give you this much concurrency. Can you handle it? If you can't handle it, tell us, and we'll put more traffic elsewhere. And if they're, if they're dishonest and they say, oh, you know, then they'll, their metrics will fall, and we'll hold them accountable to their metrics about throughput and about uh, failures and stuff like that. And so we have a complex measurement system that um, it comprehensively measures every single customer's ex quality of experience on their stream. And then that gets reported to our live operations team who are constantly watching for little movements in the graph. And if there's a... Um, request errors or if there are if if the high, a high definition rates is what we call so what percentage of the audience is watching hd and if the hd rate starts to fall that's that's a bad sign because it means that we're saturating the network um and then so we can we can say oh okay that vendor is going to get 40% of the traffic and that vendor is going to get 20% of the traffic and that vendor is going to get another 20% of the traffic and balance out who's going to get what and somebody else is going to deal with that and that means that you can go into a season or go into a week um, or a weekend or even a day knowing that you should have enough capacity for to run the event. Yeah, I remember that uh, when I was uh, watching live stream, sometimes the, the the video quality degrades for maybe you know a few seconds or a few minutes, and then it comes back. I guess that's uh, what you were talking about, right? The the CDN's uh, uh, throughput has been saturated. Um, and I remember talking to some of the guys, I think like Max, who was working on the front end, doing a lot of the video uh, player side of things. Uh, there's also some. I think uh, it was a dynamic uh, quality control so that, uh, you know, as it sees the uh, bit rates uh, drops, uh, they, they will automatically, the, on the front end, the client will automatically, I think, uh, switch to maybe a different CDN or switch to a different uh, a bit rate or file stream so that uh, it, it, it fetched them at the, at the lower um, bit rate. Is that something that, uh, uh, that you no? Know, I guess maybe that the question would be, uh, what are some of the mechanisms that we have there to protect the user experience? Um, 
make sure that the, the user gets the best experience possible. Yeah. So we the first thing you've got is is a certain degree of buffering, and buffering logic is kind of the as we refer to it as the magic source. Um, that's one of the reasons why we've moved a lot of our devices away from um, the gen the mo more popular players, the media players, um, to our own formula. And that's because we want to control the buffering logic and the retry logic and the uh, yeah the kind of request processing function is really that that can and we're talking about shaving percents because every you want to make sure that every customer is experiencing it perfectly and that can mean getting a percent here and a benefit there and a percent benefit there because that that single percent can be you know ten thousand people's experience. <laughs> um but yeah so what it does is uh, a stream if in most cases today um from from anybody who's doing mass delivery is just a series of file chunks um and we encode um five six eight ten different versions of the stream and then they're all time aligned so you can switch between the different levels and if we have problems with that fetching and we can see that there's a problem with the stream we can move up and down and a, a temporary glitch in quality will probably be something a bit more local to you rather than a, a regional effect um uh but the point at which it will then it can then also switch cdn if it's seeing that the cdn is really not performing or we've got you know we've got a request error or something like that don't bother retrying. We we call it rotating because you've got a list of CDNs that you can use, and then you just rotate to the next one, and then rotate to the next one, and then rotate to the next one because you're aiming to try and um, uh, give the best experience possible. But we also, for resilience purposes, we don't just have one origin. We call it the origin of the stream. We have multiple, and we have two origins that are identical, so an A and a B. And it's not done, it's done hot, hot. Um, uh, and that hot, hot arrangement, they're not perfectly synchronous to each other. They're, they're pretty synchronous. But basically, you can't do them as kind of an invisible AB switch currently. Um, uh, that's very hard to do uh, with video encoding uh, at a cloud scale. It used to be a lot easier on-prem, but in in cloud distributions maintaining um uh sub second accuracy of synchronization in video is very very hard um but uh yeah so we can if if one of the origins fails you can flip over to the other origin and then we have another origin which is kind of our fallback origin and then we have a disaster recovery origin <laughs> as well and yeah, we have a whole series of because we cannot fail. You know, we we must have 100% availability wherever possible. Um, it's expected from us uh, um, by our rights holders and by our customers who are passionate. The right, the customers can't come back later to watch the game, not as far as they're concerned. Um, so, whereas you might choose if you if you fail to load something on on a video on demand service. And it failed to load. You just go, oh, I'll watch something else. I'm a bit disappointed. I'll watch something else. Uh, a, 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 um, a football fan or a sports fan is going to be a lot more upset if they can't watch the game. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, you watch a game for 90 minutes and then uh, the, the goal goes in, you know, that's a two seconds segment of the 90 minutes. Uh, yeah. So, and everyone kind of just, you know, they, they, they're going there to watch a live event. It needs to be available and ready. Um, and I remember the, um, uh, what's it? Uh, sometimes I do, I do remember seeing sometimes, uh, uh, I don't know if it's uh, the stream switching happening behind the scenes, but you do see, okay, sometimes that the frame would jump, uh, but you can always just, you know, uh, go back five seconds and you can, you know, you can catch the last five seconds anyway. I do remember seeing sometimes that there's some like the frames just jumping. I don't know if it's uh, because of the, the switching streams uh, behind We're the scenes. We're now so close that you probably wouldn't notice. We just can't right. call them uh, perfect. Perfect. 
<laughs> but that's that, but that's pretty amazing in terms of the technologies that need to they need to go into it to enable that. Um, so you mentioned this like the four different streams, uh, uh, but are they all coming from the same? I guess the same cameras on the pitch that the, uh, so I guess maybe we can, can we talk about how the pictures, how the videos go from the pitch side cameras to the cloud uh, distributions or the just different CDN distributions? Yeah. Maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of work backwards because we've already gone to the CDN. So the CDN is doing our segment distribution, which right. is just chunks of video. Um, the, the head end consists of two components. Uh, three components call it three components there's uh, an origin cache which is just an nginx or varnish cache um, there's a thing called a packager the packager um, creates it in a format that your player your device expects and because apple google microsoft and the others couldn't necessarily all agree on using st same standard apple has their format Everyone else has their form. Um, and uh, we also apply the encryption at that point. Um, DRM is just AES encryption. Uh, it's a block cipher, continuous block cipher. Um, the secret of DRM is in the key exchange, not in the packager or anything like that. Um, and then, so the packager is making it in a format that you expect. And then the encoder sits before the packager um and the encoder kind of does what you'd expect it produces the the eight steps on what we call the ladder so you can step up eight different audio or so eight different video qualities and two different audio qualities before that um our encoding is all done in the cloud because actually um scaling from uh say three or four events in the middle of the week to 60 70 events at the weekend uh, and these compute instances are very big so you know you're talking um large number excel uh, encoders uh and so we have we have had incidents before where um you have to kind of tell amazon how many machines you're going to need because they're going to they're going to be worried if they run out of compute. <laughs> um, it is possible. I can tell you it is possible to make AWS run out of compute, um, at least in a particular instance classes in particular locations. Um, but I think people are a bit surprised that you can actually make AWS run out of compute. Uh, <laughs> um, Pretty crazy. You guys are stretching the limit, the capabilities of AWS and CDM providers. <laughs> yep. Uh, we can, we can, we can, we can do a lot of damage if we're not careful. Um, then, so uh, you've got to then got to get the signals to the cloud. Um, so we have uh, data centers in around London, um, two sets of those which handle the video before it goes to the cloud. You could do all of this in the cloud. It, it's a little bit more, in some ways, a little bit more challenging. Um, but you know, if you started from the scratch doing it, um, it, it as cloud native, you could you could do it easier in in different ways. But uh, we have a global um, WAN, uh, which is a private WAN, which allows us to move video uh, without any um, network effects. Uh, so we we can guarantee that we can get high quality, very high quality video all around the world whenever we need it. Um, and uh, so the, the main kind of where th what we call transmission, which is a bit of a legacy term, but uh, the transmission um, compute infrastructure will come through London. Um, our main broadcast uh, transmission facility is in Leeds in the north of England, um, and there's a backup facility in Northern Ireland. And then there are regional production centers located around the world um, that collect together. So, you know, there's a major center in Japan, you've got Munich, um, Milan, various different places, Madrid, um, where we will put put stuff together, collect the collect the events, things like that. But it, it tends to all come landing back through London, um, controlled by teams in Leeds and Northern Ireland. And 
um, in what you're doing in transmission is you are um, you're making sure that whatever you're receiving, you know, wherever it's coming from in the world, you're making sure that you always have output. <laughs> because you can you can lose the signal because it's coming in from you know coming in from so many different places you can lose the video source and you know whoever's done streaming you know you've experienced that situation where somebody drops out something like that if you just put the stadium connected directly to the um to the cloud encoders what would you do if something went wrong um but also how do you insert ads how ads are a revenue source, and I won't <laughs> um, dwell on what people think uh, one way or the other, but you know we have to have processes to insert ads, but also we're not the only one who consumes these feeds, so whether we had ads or not, we'd have to cover the break um so there's a break in play uh we have to fill that with something um we also fill it with uh, uh, like mini documentaries and stuff like that so that has to go through a process we call play out which is inserting some ads inserting um uh other interstitial content we call it uh, which is something that's not an ad but is something that you might enjoy watching um and also cover and cover is when things go wrong because um we might lose a feed from a stadium. We might um, have a match disrupted for some reason. And, you know, if it's rain in tennis, what are you going to do? You, you can just show the tennis court for two hours while they're waiting for the rain to stop. Or you can put something else up. And so that's the kind of play out component of transmission. Um, there's a thing called MCR, Master Control Room. And MCR's job is to make sure that it's leaving TX, not manage TX themselves. TX is a separate team who are making sure that uh, the, their, their, event, their event is working. But once it leaves TX, it's now MCR's responsibility going up to the cloud. And then MCR is also making sure that the signals are arriving. And we have so many different stadiums around the world and venues around the world and you know it could be from a, a satellite truck in um the sudan or not sudan probably i don't know somewhere it, it could be in a, a satellite truck in africa if it's a if it's the um one of the the races across the desert or something like that or it could be um a las vegas casino it could be a football stadium, um, uh, but it also might not be coming only to us. It might be going uh, to multiple broadcasters. So we're just one of the consumers of it. Uh, it might be dedicated to us or we might be the host broadcaster. We might own the right to it in the case of, say, many of the boxing matches we do. And then we've not only got to send it to ourselves, we've also got to send it out to all of our syndicated partners. So MCR provides a really solid kind of nexus point for for everything that's coming in and out of the zone, uh, whether it be a fully prepared stream or whether it be a, um, something that's that's coming in a bit rough and needs to be treated and then uh, and syndicated on, something like that. Um, so we have a lot of complicated switching and processing of um, high quality video uh, streams. Um, and, you know, we're talking anything from three gigabits per second um, uh, over IP uh, to um, uh, 45 or 15 megabits, um, some of it. Um, but uh, yeah, it can go, it can, I mean, you know, and yeah, uh, three gigabits per second IP video, uh, uncompressed, uh, is, is quite meaty. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I think people, a lot of people put, 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 don't realize uh, how much uh, physical infrastructure and human inf infrastructure have to be put in place uh, for things like that to happen. Because I do, uh, I do know that um, a lot of the uh, football, uh, certainly in the Premier League, uh, they have all these, uh, you know, video cameras. All of that are owned by the by the team and the stadium, and then they um, they send it to broadcasters uh, who has the rights. Uh, in this case, it would be the Zone or maybe Sky Sport or somebody else. Um, and then I guess you no, know, they had, you know, I imagine that the MCRs would be people with the you know, all these different camera angles, and that they are doing the, the the button switching to say, okay, now put the ads on now, or to do something, or to show the replay for the last uh, uh, for uh, for the goal for the last ten seconds, and then I guess only at that point, then the data started getting sent to. Uh, our data centers to uh, well, to the cloud to do the video encoding and then okay and then that goes to the CDM providers to the multiple CDM providers uh, okay yeah and there's a lot, there's a lot multiple layers of treatment that go on so we can uh, we can we very rarely would have something where we would look at multiple angles at, at, at the MCR or TX level that okay. would be more done at the stadium so at the stadium you've got all the cameras there they go to a truck which has vision mixer which is a, a big desk with um so the famous thing is the um in the death star when he pulls the lever forward to uh, right. fire the death star that's right. actually, if you if you go google that right now you will see um that's a grass valley mixing desk okay <laughs> um for tv that's called a vision mixer and um it's you know somebody used that whatever it was a half a million pound mixer they must have rented or something like that because it looked cool um and yeah just a whole load of buttons where you've got all of your sources going in and out um that's what will happen at the truck and then a prepared version of that um comes out of the truck and it comes either via satellite or via fiber or via diverse fibers. So you've got to make sure you have two different fibers going via two different routes that never cross each other anywhere in the world, <laughs> uh, which can be a challenge um, because you don't, what you don't want is some digger to cut through the fiber and, and you lose it. So you have to plan all these things like, what's my diverse fiber route? And then I've got my fiber optics, which is my high quality from the stadium. And then maybe if it's a really critical event, I've also got a satellite truck to bring it back to me. Or if I can't get fiber, then I'll use it via satellite, but I'll have to, the satellite link isn't always the highest quality compared to fiber. So you've got a little bit of a balance there. And then when it gets to us, what we're doing is kind of finishing it off um making it just making it that little bit last bit of the zone polish on top of something that was probably quite generic for multiple broadcasters um around the world and th there is a thing called remote production um which uh, you know we've done some work on um it's not the most common thing in the world at the moment uh, because actually you need things like 40 gigabit links from stadiums and stuff like that which can be challenging <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys uh, use uh, uh, Elemental and things like that? Because I thought the Elemental was supposed to also be able to get you those that you know, access to live uh, video streams from you know, cameras on a pitch and things like that. Yeah, so we use our our main um, head end, what you could consider to be our main head end at the moment. Um, our main origin uses Elemental Media Live as the encoder, and that can have multiple sources in it. But controlling that to do all of the prettiness that we want for the high-end matches, it's not the best control surface to do that with. We have we have um, some very nice tools that allow us to kind of manage the flow of the show as it goes through. And so before the show starts, it will put some nice animations up and then it will do nice transition into the pre-match stuff and then it will insert the markers for the ads and then if you have an issue you've kind of got these pre-made macros that you can bring up and it's like a touch surface so you've got you, you you're just using a touch screen control to and a, uh to to kind of do what you want to do next rather than having to kind of um elemental is a bit more of a raw tool um uh, and a, a little bit simple 
for the the richness of features and elemental gets better every year in terms of its capabilities um but uh as a play out surface it's i think even they would admit it's not up there with the best play out systems that you can get and we do have some of the best play out systems you can get to give our the best experience we can do and I also note that the, the zone does a lot of uh, its own commentaries. Uh, it's got its own uh, commentary team. In fact, I, I remember someone telling me uh, in Germany that uh, a lot of people watch the zone because they really like the guy that does the, the football commentaries uh, on the, for uh, Bundesliga. So does that bit happen in the MCR or is that happen uh, before or after that? So sometimes you'll get commentary that comes from on the incoming feed. Um, so that that might be a game that we've or an event that we're we're running in the but a lot of the time um what happens is we get the the world feed which is what we call you know it's the generic version that has the stadium atmospheric sound but has no commentary um and that arrives with us at the mcr and then they will link in over ip links um a commentator who is sitting in a in a room somewhere um, in the world. Uh, um, we have these commentator booths um, which people can sit in, and they have headphones and a monitor and microphone and all that kind of thing. Um, and then they see an ultra low latency version of our stream, and then um, they're commenting on that, and then that gets sent. The, the audio from them gets sent back and then remixed within the stream. And the good thing about audio is that audio encoding takes very little time. So from the time it takes to send that signal to Munich to a commentator for them to to commentate on it um, and then get back to us is just a fraction of a second. So it doesn't really introduce any any overhead for us, but it means that we can mix in commentators anywhere in the world. So you know we could have a we could have a german bundesliga match uh, commentated by somebody in japan um just because we can do that you know they they can we can we can create in any language we see fit to um well anything that makes commercial sense for us to to provide um uh, a commentator for yeah, I guess that makes uh, some of the localization experience a lot better because you can have uh, someone, like you said, uh, commentating in Japan in Japanese and uh, showing a Japanese uh, commentated uh, stream to the Japanese audience. Yeah, and we've we've had incidents, we have had not incidents, we had occasions where there's been a Japanese player who's been very popular in Europe. Um, uh, sorry, it's been a, a, a Japanese player who's playing for a big European team. And that creates a great deal of interest. And so we end up having a large audience for European football in Japan. Um, and so it deserves that little bit more treatment than uh, just if we were going to say, you know, there's a niche audience or they can watch it in, in, in German or English. Because, well, you know, hiring a commentator to commentate for, uh, um, for those games for a small audience might not be justified but if if there's a decent size audience then creating a local version can be um, can be an advantage okay so you know, quite a few things you've talked about so, so far kind of you know you've got this really uh, this resilience uh, architecture whereby everything has got like a fallback you've got your fallback on CDNs you've got your fallback on the, on, on the uh, fiber optic cables uh, and then we also have uh, four bags on the on the, on the front end as well as on the back end side of things. Uh, you know, resilience. Uh, when we when we're looking at the, the zones uh, coming up, the engineering principles, uh, resilience was like number one, uh, uh, pretty much above uh, all else. Uh, number two was scalability. Um, so, what are some of the I mean, building systems with this kind of level of uh, resilience uh, to make sure that uh, when the live event is happening, you have to be hundred percent up? Uh, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned about? Uh, that and what are some of the biggest challenges uh, that uh, that comes up when you have to you know, think about the you know, really high number of uh, uh, you know, uptime? I would say that you have to be careful as to um, what you've got 
economy of scale as well because you can the as you move from one part of you know one stage of your business to another stage of the business the what costs you money can change and a lot of engineers aren't particularly exposed to the cost implications or the the overheads that their decisions make and um you know we're deciding that because you're part of the project needs to store some data that you're going to spin up a database have you thought about the consequences of that it, that's creating a whole new instance and it's easy to go from having you know uh, um a, so, some instances or to sit in your domain and then that problem can kind of balloon and then you're you're thinking about you know what's impacting my resources and what's costing me um uh but also um compute efficiency can start to play a big factor because if i'm thinking about um uh what it was taking to run a function at one scale but then is does that make sense when i'm suddenly going from 10000 to over a million concurrent requests or not concurrent requests but a million concurrent users the the decision le levels that you need to take because actually the execution time of your code can really make a decision um and we've also had stuff uh interestingly around the use of ALBs versus NLBs and because you can hit limits um uh w w you think oh you know well Amazon's providing a service it's got to be unlimited no there are there are limits to what you can actually request in uh on certain services and there are patterns that you need to talk to um experts and talk to either 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 Amazon themselves or people who've got experience when you're saying you know, why why can't i get the most out of this because i'm suddenly realizing that i'm saturating it um and it it can be quite funny when you're sitting there and you're going oh i i can't just do that i i reach i reach a that <laughs> Oh, uh, what do I do? I don't know. I need to do something different. I need to completely change the way that load balancing works, or I need to change the way that auto scaling works, or I need to rewrite my code from TypeScript into Rust or Go or something else that is more compute efficient. Do I, do I want to, um, not run some I, I designed something because i thought serverless lambda was going to be perfect but actually i can't do that in lambda because um i can't get enough lambda execution time available to me so i actually have to run it as um uh, as a containerized solution instead because i i need it to be heavier and it, it i can get a little bit more performance a little you know a little bit more performance and cost effectiveness out of running it as a container maybe at, at a certain scale um and the other one is i'm doing a lot of work on proper edge compute and i have to be really careful because i'm doing that on cdns and if i do edge compute on the cdn is that taking away from the number of hundreds of gigabits per second i can deliver <laughs> um on each node and ah you know what what's the is that going to negatively affect customer experience even though i'm doing something necessary around you know i've done some work on advanced tokenization at the edge lately and you know worrying about the execution time and how long does it take to calculate a hash uh how many hashes can i have in this token before we run out of compute execution time at the edge uh can be quite can be quite fine grained problems it's it's like optimizing the linux kernel or something like that it can be quite uh, um a problem that you're trying to solve yeah, certainly the the kind of problems you run up uh, you come up against though when you're running at scale is uh, quite is very different. 
I remember you know, when we when, uh, when we first started talking about this, uh, you talk about the, how the big uh, uh, up ramp in terms of the traffic, because everybody logs in the same time. Uh, and on, on the API side of things, uh, yeah, we saw a lot of that, and uh, it was one of the reasons that uh, we actually ran into some of the scale, the burst capacity limit on Lambda. So you know we couldn't use the Lambda for. Um, most of the APIs on that critical path of somebody logging in and start watching a stream uh, because your traffic would go from a few hundred, maybe, I don't know, whatever request, hundreds, no, some reason of baseline to suddenly 100x in the minute, in, in, the, in, in a minute or maybe two minutes uh, time window. My best so, was, uh, was one, we, we had, a, well, not my worst, but not the greatest moment, was we had an API, um, which I won't say which API it was, but uh, it was, getting 500 RPS um, and then something happened with the stream that caused every front-end device to make a call <laughs> uh, and we went from 500 RPS to 60,000 RPS in the space of under five seconds <laughs> yeah yeah that can happen <laughs> uh, when you when you've got millions of concurrent yeah. users. And the ability of streaming to create stampedes is something that I don't think you people experience in other. You know, there's the what do you call it the the hacker news effect, um, right? Uh, that kind of thing. No, that that's gentle compared to what we can do when we have something that causes a small glitch in the player which then causes an api request um from a hundred thousand or a million users at once um and it's because it's video it's time aligned yeah and I guess also the, uh, one of the challenges also is that uh, a lot of the time, the, because it's, you know, you're serving live content, a lot of things may not be as cacheable as uh, you would be otherwise. And also because the requests all come you know, exactly at the same time, uh, maybe you, know, you, know, you haven't had a chance to cache that previous request before you handle the next one. Yeah. So there's a lot of challenges that makes uh, some of the, I guess, the more traditional you know, web traffic uh, patterns and the best practices make it quite hard to apply in this particular situation. Yeah, pay, I know that from the API side of Applications, yeah, that's entitlement it. Yeah. checks, um, cryptographic functions for, for handing out keys. They're all really tough. Yeah, things that, that seems uh, you know simple in pretty much every single other use case uh, suddenly becomes a you know, potential problem that's going to trip you up. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, at the same time, it's, you know, it's one of the more interesting uh, things I've, I've ever worked on. Uh, it's some of the challenges that really makes you think much deeper uh, in terms of, okay, every decision you're making, there's a you know, small, small change can have a big cost impact uh, and small change can have also, you know, have a big impact on your uptime as well, yeah. which uh, as we talked about is uh, number one for the zone engineering. And having in excess of 30 different players, you know, you've got, multiple different Android apps, uh, your Android TV apps, you've got different platforms you're distributing to, you've got every smart TV in the world that you're trying to address. Um, it means that any single change to a front-end API has to be really carefully thought through, really, um, um, uh, and the rollout strategies can also be quite challenging. To, to say, oh, you know, I've got to put this feature in. Um, I need to make this change. How do I identify? How do I target? How do I get the teams? Have I got, is it a platform that's depreciated? Is it a platform that we're struggling to get developers time on? Um, you know, those sorts of things can be really painful for, for feature releases or security patching, not patching as much as sort of security features and things like that, which is something I'm responsible for. So, yeah, there can be a lot of different challenges. And I remember there was also, uh, like, uh, I guess there was set up boxes. Um, some of them are running. They don't even run the standard HTML. They've got like custom implementation of HTML. So there's uh, things like that, which I remember some of the front end teams uh, was was always have to be quite careful about in terms yeah, of code changes. No EME, MSE. Yeah, that's it. None of that. Um, you've got native native API. Some of them aren't even. Yeah, they're they're running different uh, things like CE HTML. 
Okay. Who's heard of CEHTML <laughs> apart from a few people in the media industry? Um, uh, yeah, and then you've got things like Roku, which has its own magical script called BrightScript, oh. uh, um, which is no, nobody else uses that. Uh, um, <laughs> so yeah, it can be quite weird. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, uh, I guess uh, you know. In that case, uh, uh, what are some? You know, I guess uh, what would you say is that the number one the uh, biggest lesson you've learned uh, from your time with the zone? I suppose that it's um, yeah the the kind of impact blast radius of decisions. You need to you need to really think about that, and um, also the experience in scaling can bring up surprises that you didn't really you didn't really expect. Um, in order to maintain that kind of high level, high quality, high um, demand, dealing, coping with all that demand, and also changing fast, uh, the experience of, of rapid growth of a business, um, uh, to, and, and to, to be able to capture so much in, in just a few years. Um, there are businesses that their customer base scales quite rapidly. But I don't think there are businesses that grow both in their breadth and their and and their demand at the same time to that to that degree where where you end up offering, you know, ten times more than you did before, while also delivering to you know n times many customers um, uh, that kind of growth. Uh, I think just if it was just dealing with a massive growth of customers like that would be a different problem to also at the same time trying to offer a wider breadth to customers that's that's it's a it's been a challenge and um, it's been a fulfilling thing to work with great people as well um, in design on on making something that i don't think a lot of other people have experienced so you it, it's been really good to, to kind of deal with those challenges as well. Yeah, it's definitely been the, one of the best teams that I've worked with. Uh, some really, really smart people, um, people that are still keeping in touch with, like Luca, um, who's doing amazingly well at the, at the, at the AWS. Um, but yeah, Bob, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, I, I'm really glad that more people have heard about uh, some of the things that, uh, some of the magic that you guys have been working on the video side of things. Uh, I've learned a lot myself as well. So thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you for having me on. It's been a good time. Yeah, and the best of luck. Uh, I'm still like, no, I'm still enjoying uh, uh, my the, the zone account and the watching football match every now and then. Great. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the good work. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay, take care, guys. Okay, bye bye. bye.